to our second part of the Ancient Mediterranean Unit. Um, this next series of lectures will be on Ancient Egypt. So we cover typically two periods within Ancient Egyptian history for the AP curriculum. That's the Old Kingdom and the New Kingdom. There is a Middle Kingdom, yes, but we don't really talk about it because it's relatively short and none of our AP artworks come from that period. So as we saw with uh, Ancient Mesopotamia, these ancient, ancient civilizations are super relying on these massive waterways for a lot of the, the vitality and the well-being of these emerging nations and cities and states. So the Nile River is the basically the backbone, almost literally, of ancient Egyptian civilization. Um, water from Lake Victoria, which is kind of in um, central Af Africa um, and is supplied by melting snow, um, flows northward down the Nile River and then into the Mediterranean Sea. So um, this is sometimes a little bit difficult for students to understand. Um, the northern part of Egypt is called Lower Egypt, and the um, southern part of Egypt is called Upper Egypt. So a lot of students are confused by this. It's because this is the direction that the Nile is flowing. It flows from south to north into the Mediterranean Sea. So like even like the regional designations of this of this nation are defined based on the flow of the Nile. So that's something to keep in mind. So one of the reasons that the Nile is, is such a, a vital part of um, ancient Egypt is the, is the um, annual flooding of the Nile Delta as well as the surrounding lands. So this is a great diagram right here that kind of illustrates like everything that's within a close proximity to the Nile River is fertile. These are the Kemet or black lands and they're called black lands because of the nutrient rich silt um, that is being brought down the Nile. So this is the stuff that is fertilizing all of the plants and providing this this nutrient rich basis for this river ecosystem and pretty much anything that's not within direct contact of the Nile River is the red lands or the desert so there, this is basically the only reason that civilization can be here is because of the Nile River and the resources that it provides there's also lots of travel that's happening um, down the Nile as well that is facilitating travel and trade and so on we'll get more into that in a little bit so the ancient Egypt as we know it, as this kind of like monolithic civilization, lasted for about 3,000 years. So it's, it's kind of difficult to describe how much time that is. Um, so one of the things that I do is I say this is 15, 1, 5, 15 times longer than the United States has been around as a country. So, and the thing that's remarkable about ancient Egypt is that like throughout these 3,000 years, um, Egypt was relatively stable. We saw in the ancient Mesopotamia lecture that these lands were changing hands and names um, constantly because there were so many squabbles over them. Whereas ancient Egypt has its periods of discord um, and chaos, but relatively speaking, it remains quite stable. Um, and it wasn't regularly conquered by foreign powers until around 1000 BCE. That's when we start seeing um, the Assyrians and the Persians and the, the Romans coming in. So um, another thing that a lot of people kind of forget about ancient Egypt is its influence on um, artwork that is happening in the northern part of the Mediterranean. So a lot of people tend to assume that ancient Greece and ancient Rome are like the, the birthplaces of modern Western art. Um, this is not consistent with the evidence that we have coming down through art history. Um, so an example of this are um, basically the conventions of human figures. So so the ancient Egyptians produced these, these quite canonized human figures um, in these very rigid positions where you have one foot in front of the other and the arms bound to the side. It's very upward posture. This is typically called a pharaoh pose. And some of the earlier artwork that we're seeing um, out of ancient Greece is almost exactly the same as these kinds of sculptures. So we're seeing a clear influence here. And based off of the time periods, we have to assume that the Greeks are being influenced by the Egyptians here.
So um, another thing that's really remarkable about Egyptian art is that it reminds, it remains remarkably consistent throughout its history. So these are two pieces right here of a pharaoh in a smiting pose, basically holding a mace or a club about to strike an enemy's head. And these were created 2,000 years apart. 2,000 years apart. And they look remarkably similar. This is a sunken relief and this is a raised relief, but the image is virtually the same. So that's one of the things that is, is very, it's one of the reasons that ancient Egyptian artwork is so recognizable is that it's very canonized. Um, the ancient Egyptians also had a writing system. Um, you've probably seen them before. They're called hieroglyphs. You can see a couple of them in the top right of this image right here. Um, they're basically these pictographic symbols that corresponded to sounds. You string some of those sounds together and then you end up with complete words. So it kind of works like katakana in Japanese. Um, the seat of power in ancient Egypt were the pharaohs or kings. They are seen as sacred and godlike, um, descended from these um, these de these lines of deities and gods. They were oftentimes seen as like gods on earth, and they were treated accordingly. So. Um, one thing that's also important to remember about ancient Egypt is that they probably produced a lot of art that does not survive currently because it was lost um, in some way, shape, or form. So most of the artwork that comes down to us that we know of has been found in tombs and burial sites, um, and it has been preserved and sealed away from the elements, which is why we happen to have it now. So um, there is a clear bias here in terms of the artworks that are being made. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, so most of the artworks, I believe all of them that we're seeing in this unit, um, are um, really emphasizing these themes of death, rebirth, and the afterlife. So in terms of materials and resources, ancient Egypt is a pretty different from ancient Mesopotamia. For one thing, um, the ancient Egyptians have lots of different kinds of stone available to them, which is allowing them to create those gigantic pyramids. Um, they also have some access to wood. They're still importing wood from other places such as Syria, but there's a lot of local species that are perfect for building things like coffins and statues. So um, stone was primarily shaped using um, tools and then you could um, sand it down with literal sand. Um, the ancient Egyptians were also pretty well known for their metalwork and jewelry. Um, a lot of ancient pharaohs and um, pharaohs' wives were buried with their finest jewelry, um, oftentimes using gold and silver alloys. Um, there's also this material called faience, um, which is this uh, turquoise blue substance that is made out of quartz, and then it could actually be cast in molds like glass. So there's several different colors of faience. Another thing that's important to note is that like a lot of the, the stuff that is coming down through ancient Egypt is thousands of years old. Um, and remarkably, we have some objects that are made of wood from this time period. Um, there is, again, a sort of bias for wood because in, that in discoveries because this is a very dry climate. So there's, there's not going to be as much bacterial activity that's going to be degrading the wood. So we do tend to see a lot more wood artifacts in these environments where there's not going to be conditions that are degrading the wood. So um, I, unfortunately, I had to break down this diagram into two pieces, but it's a really good visual illustration of basically who's having control over um, ancient Egypt as we know it, and basically like the how the power is rising um, throughout the dynastic period, reaching the zenith in the New Kingdom, and then we have these excuse me, these um, foreign influences that are coming in um, and taking over the land and then eventually diminishing the influence and power of ancient Egypt as we know it. So um, the period that we talk about um, in the AP curriculum is the early dynastic period all the way through to the New Kingdom. So we're only really talking about this period right here. So before this, um, Ancient Egypt consists of a lot of more kind of like individual um, prehistoric settlements, um, these that are more independent. There's not really like a unified power. That doesn't really happen until um, King Narmer in the um, early dynastic period. Um, and then after the fall of the New Kingdom, we have these foreign powers that are controlling most of ancient Egypt.
So this is our first artwork, um, and this is King Narmer, who was the first sort of um, pharaoh of Egypt as a, a nation. So this um, is actually intended to be a larger commemorative version of a makeup palette. So um, you've probably seen um, images of ancient Egyptians or reconstructions where they have this um, black eyeliner over their eyes. So um, this is very similar to the function this, of the black lines underneath the eyes of football players and other sports people um, to basically prevent the glare from blinding them. So that it, it served a similar function in ancient Egypt as well. So there was actually a recess on the back of this palette um, that is round where you would basically grind up the, the powder that was used for the eye makeup um, that you could then um, kind of like have in, in the recess and then use for eye makeup. So this is a much larger version of that relatively small kind of like makeup mirror sized tool. So there is a narrative that is being shown here. We have King Narmer, who you'll notice is the largest figure and tallest figure by far in this composition. He is holding a mace um, in his right hand, and in his left hand there is a fallen enemy who he is about to murder. There is also a little dude over here on his own separate platform. This is a sandal bearer. So this is basically the guy that carries all of Narmer's stuff around, including his shoes. Um, and then there's also some figures down here that might be conquered enemies. So I'm going to go through um, a couple of the other symbols and motifs in the following slides. So this is an example of a narrative, particularly the narrative of the creation of dynastic Egypt. So um, before Egypt was unified under these dynastic rules, um, they were separated into Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, which we saw on these slides here. And this unification effort was facilitated over this um, span of what was likely several decades, um, particularly by King Narmer. So these are events that are happening over a long period of time, but based on what we're seeing in this narrative, it seems like things are happening kind of simultaneously. So again, we have this hierarchy of scale. These the figures that are the largest are typically the most important. Um, there's also some hieroglyphs on this piece. There's some right here as well as some right here. We're not quite sure what this means, but we know that this symbol up here of a catfish and a chisel means an armor. So um, what you also notice too is that there are registers. So remember the standard of Ur um, from our previous lecture where there are these narrative bands that are basically ground lines for figures to stand on. We're seeing one of them right here for Narmer and the enemy and then another one for his sandal bearer right here. So this is the front of the palette right here. Um, so we're seeing the same motif of this horned goddess figure on both sides of the palette. Uh, we're not entirely sure if she's Bot or Hawthor. There is the, uh, we also have this motif of Narmer's name right here. In this particular narrative, again, we're seeing Narmer, who is the largest figure on this register, his sandal bear, as well as a priest, and then they're bearing these standards. So these are basically like ritual, items that are carried in a procession. There's also this particularly grisly image on the right here of decapitated and castrated enemies that have been lined up. Um, there's also another interesting motif on this bottom register right here of a bull and a man. Um, and it, it looks like they're um, infiltrating the walls of a city. So there might be this um, this comparison of Narmer has a strength of a, of a bull and that he is going in and like knocking down the walls of this city. These two creatures right here with the long necks are referred to as serpapurds, um, serpent leopards, um, and they are um, intertwining their necks to create the recess in this makeup palette. So again, here's the front um, with all of the important things helpfully labeled. This figure over here too, like falcons um, feature pretty prominently in ancient Egyptian mythology. They represent the god Horus, um, who appears pretty frequently and usually represents the sun. This is our next piece, the seated scribe. 
So this statuette is around a foot and a half tall, and it was buried in a tomb in Saqqara in Lower Egypt. Um, so you'll notice that is it a, that it is a painted sculpture, which is quite remarkable given that it's at least 4,500 years old. Um, you saw in our previous lectures that we have a lot of um, statues from classical antiquity that are around 2,000 years old or 2,500 years old and their paint has been completely worn away. So this statue is around 2,000 years older than that and still has um, the paint on it. So it was. Um, this was primarily because it was preserved in a tomb. It was sealed away from the elements, so it's in remarkable condition. So statuettes like this um, were usually referred to as shabti, and they were created to accompany a high-ranking individual in death. So in a lot of cultures, um, essentially when a rich person died, they would have some sort of... Uh, there was usually this overarching belief that they would go into the next world and live a pretty similar life that they did previously um, and that they would need stuff in order to carry on their lifestyle. And one of those things, of course, is servants. So in some cultures, they would just kill a couple of dozen people and like bury them with the important person and that would be kind of like the way of them carrying their servants into the afterlife. In some situations there's a bit more of a, a, a more merciful way of doing that and that was by burying these figures that were intended to represent servants. So a scribe was something that was particularly important in ancient Egypt. This is basically a dude that is writing down all the cool things you did so that you have a legacy. So what you'll notice too in this figure is that he, he's not in peak physical condition. When you look at statues of other like um, figures, particularly pharaohs, they have almost this Dorito-shaped body. Um, they are in peak physical condition. They're very fit looking. Their faces are very symmetrical. Um, they don't really have any body fat from what we can see. But when we look at this figure, he's, he's, he's quite lifelike. He has these kind of like um, this sagging chest. He's not particularly toned. He's a scribe. He's kind of like a nerd. So the image is not a portrait either. This is not representing any one person, but rather an idealized scribe. Like if you want, if you are having a scribe in the afterlife, this is what you want him to look like. He is the perfect scribe. He's ready to go. His eyes are open and attentive. His back is straight. He has a stylus in his hand. He's ready to go. He also has a slab of papyrus right here in his hand. So papyrus is this um, is this material that is made out of the papyrus plant. Um, it, you basically cut it into sheets and then you can um, hammer it. Um, you weave it together and then you, you hammer it flat and let it dry. And this is basically ancient paper. Um, and a lot of records were written on papyrus. So there was a stylus in his hand as well that he was using to write. It has since been lost. Our next piece is the Great Pyramids and Great Sphinx of Giza. So um, these were massive monuments and tombs dedicated to deceased pharaohs. So there were three um, pharaohs that basically commissioned these massive pyramids. And what's super funny to me is that Mankari was the first one. He probably thought when he had this pyramid built, like, this thing is super great. Like, nobody's ever going to be able to top this. And then his descendant, um, Khafre, was like, you know what? I'm going to make an even bigger pyramid to, so I can show up my ancestor to show how important I am. And then Khufu was like, you know what? My pyramid is going to be even bigger and even taller. So there's this kind of like pettiness that we're seeing um, in terms of like everybody wants to be bigger and greater than the person before them. So um, what's interesting about the pyramids is that they actually look a lot different today than they did um, at the time that they were constructed. This is a, um, a reconstruction of what the pyramids actually looked like. They were covered in this um, white... Um, white limestone facing that was actually polished so that it was shiny. So you can imagine you're in the middle of the desert um, and you you look up and you see this super shiny, almost blindingly white, 480 foot tall structure that is topped with gold. This is going to be something that is absolutely like jaw slackeningly inspiring. And like you look at this thing and you're like, oh my gosh, like I believe in the power of the gods um, and of the might of the Pharaoh. 
So um, unfortunately, a lot of the stone facing fell off over se several subsequent earthquakes, and then a lot of people came and collected the stones and then used them in their own buildings. So the pyramids um, are likely modeled off of this shape called the Ben Ben, which was the symbol of the cult of Ra. So Ra is the Egyptian god of the sun. You can imagine that the sun has a pretty uh, has a has a place of significance within ancient Egyptian mythology, um, as we saw with the ancient Mesopotamians. So each pyramid has an accompanying causeway, so basically like a catwalk and a mortuary temple at the very end. So basically what happened when a pharaoh died was that he would be, there, were, there was this very systematic process of embalming him and preparing him for the afterlife. So all like a lot of his major organs would be preserved. Um, his body would be dipped in natron salt for 40 days. Like it was this whole thing. And then there were these, there was this massive procession that took him from the place where he was embalmed to his final resting place, which was in one of these pyramid tombs. So it was this big thing, like um, pharaohs, um, like the people that were organizing these funerals would hire mourners that would like scream and tear out their hair. It was basically like a party um, to, to celebrate the passage to the next world. And there was this massive procession. Um, and these are what these structures were built for was this funeral. A couple of these um, pyramids also have smaller pyramids. Um, in one case, too, there's mastabas, which are basically like stepped pyramids next to them. These are usually for the queens. Oops. So um, the mortuary temples and pyramid entrances were always directed east. So this is the direction of the sunrise. So this is really important. We have like the sunrise and then the sun setting in the west. Um, again, the sun is op is operating as a, a pretty significant role in ancient Egyptian mythology. So you can imagine that the Great Pyramids and the Great Sphinx are requiring an extraordinary amount of labor and effort to create. So each of the limestone blocks used excuse me, in the construction of the Great Pyramids weighed about 5,000 pounds or more. Um, and there were hundreds of thousands of blocks that were used to construct each pyramid. So um, there's actually been some archeological evidence um, found of building foundations near the pyramids um, where up to 4,000 skilled laborers would have worked and lived um, for several years during the construction of the pyramids. There's also evidence of these man-made canals that were built um, to basically connect the main body of the Nile to this location. Um, and these canals were built so that they could get these stone blocks from a quarry several miles away down the river and used to construct the pyramids. So there were all of these innovations that were that were made to construct these pyramids. So you can imagine how like important these were to these people that they're going through all this trouble to build this massive towering structure in the middle of the desert. So the tallest of the pyramids, um, the um, Khufu Pyramid, is about 480 feet high. So we wouldn't see a taller man-made structure until the medieval era, around 3,800 years later. So this is an extremely significant development in human history. Um, the Sphinx is another addition to this particular collection of buildings. Um, this was carved on site from a massive piece of limestone in C2, um, and it re represents this composite human and animal figure. We have the body of a lion or a cat, and then the head of a man. So cats were seen as sacred in Egypt. You could actually be put to death if you accidentally killed one. People shaved off their eyebrows in mourning when their cats died. Um, there were several gods, including the goddess Bastet, that were associated with cats. So they occupied this position of power um, and significance in ancient Egyptian mythology. So you'll notice that the, um, the, the Sphinx has portions of its face and nose missing. Um, there's some evidence that they were deliberately removed. So this might have been an ancient example of iconoclasm. So the um, Great Sphinx was actually once covered in red, pig red pigment to stand out against the desert. So we had these towering white pyramids topped with gold and this rust red Sphinx um, kind of standing and guarding them right here. This is our final piece for the day. This is a, um, a gray whack 
portrait of King Menkaure and a female figure that might be a queen or a goddess. We're not entirely sure. So this is a high relief sculpture. Um, it's neg it was um, a subtractive sculpture, so it was once one large piece of gray whack and then portions were removed. Um, it was designed in a way that the negative space could be relatively conserved so that there was no hollowing out of the space between the figures or the figure's legs and arms. So the male figure has been identified as Menkaure, who is the first um, dude to build a pyramid in this arrangement here. Uh, the female figure could be e e either one of his queens or a goddess. We're not entirely sure. What's interesting is that she has this affectionate gesture. She has one arm on his bicep and the other curled around his waist. Um, so it's a gesture of affection. There's physical contact, but their faces are still relatively blank and placid, and they're not looking at each other, but rather straight ahead. So there's this there's this kind of like strange to us relationship of physical intimacy and affection that is being implied here. Um, what's also interesting is that the figures are of similar height. So we know from other art, art examples from um, ancient Egypt that height and, and scale are pretty important. So this um, relatively similar height might, su might suggest a, a similar, like a sharing of power or the, this notion that the figures are of equal status. So you'll also notice that the male figure is quite idealized. His face is ageless. He's lean and muscular. As I mentioned previously, he's got a bit of a Dorito body going. Uh, and he's standing in this canonized pharaoh pose with the hands clenched in fists at the waist and one foot placed in front of the other um, with their backs straight and they're very stout and rigid. So this particular statue might have served as a vessel for the ka or spirit after the pharaoh died. So basically the, the mythos is that when, when a person dies, then their ka um, or their spirit goes on a journey and kind of gets lost. And then upon mummification, the ka then recognizes the spirit again and inhabits the body. And that's what facilitates the movement to the afterlife. So this is something that is intended to be timeless and eternal. So this statue was probably originally painted um, based off of evidence that we have and that the intent was that the paint would wear away over time to reveal the gray whack, um, this, this dark black stone underneath. So the color black, particularly for skin, was significant to the ancient Egyptians. Um, the god Osiris, um, who is basically like the king of the gods, um, is oftentimes depicted with this um, dark green or black skin um, like the and it's, there's a lot of references to like the color of the Nile silt. So there's this notion that there's this, um, this emulation of Osiris, who is the king of the gods and also one of the reigning figures of the underworld in this particular work.